Deb Leipzig. Thank you, Sasha. And welcome to everyone on the line today. I hope you're all doing well and that you and your families and loved ones continue to stay healthy and safe. We're grateful for you to be joining us for today's Fighting Hate From Home webinar, the Abraham Accords, one year into a warm peace. Today's call will share insights on the progress in the region since the historic treaty between Israel and the United Arab Emirates was signed, fostering engagement between governments and societies. To get us started, I'm pleased to introduce ADL CEO and National Director, Jonathan Greenblatt. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Deb. I appreciate that introduction. And I wanna say hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us for this really important and timely conversation. You know, so often in this line of work, we deal with topics that are daunting, disturbing, or just depressing. So I'm especially excited that we're gathering here today for what's really an uplifting feel-good story of overcoming old enmities in the Middle East in order to cooperate on building peace, encouraging tolerance, and creating a better future for all children across the region. Last week marked the one year anniversary of the Abraham Accords signing ceremony on the White House lawn, an instance in which ADL commended the Trump administration for getting this particular foreign policy issue right, for betting big on encouraging peace between Israel and interested countries in the Arab world. Virtually overnight, with the signing of the UAE Israel Peace Treaty, as well as an additional declaration of intent to move in that direction between Israel and the Kingdom of Bahrain, the number of Arab countries at peace with the Jewish state more or less doubled overnight. And after Bahrain's peace agreement with Israel was finalized, the following month, both Morocco and then to a lesser extent, the Sudan also started making big steps in that, that direction. And as a result, in building on Israel's longstanding peace with Egypt and Jordan, Today, half of the people in the Arab world actually live in countries that recognize the state of Israel. Just think about that for a moment. When the country still faces the threat of delegitimization from so many, including here at home. Again, that's half of the Arab world actually lives in peace with the Jewish state. And so much of this state of affairs was triggered by one gutsy decision by one brave leader, and that's the United Arab Emirates, that was willing to take that first step, agreeing in August of last year to full normalization of Israel, partially in exchange for Israel's decision to suspend its plan to annex large parts of the West Bank. I think that bold move and the decision on both sides demonstrated a kind of responsible leadership that we so often seem to lack in this world and helped unlock a cascade of peace initiatives in the region. That I do hope in time will also help to bring into reality a two-state solution for resolving the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. ADL commended these developments. We have been in support of a two-state solution since 1994. And we also heralded the steps that followed for consolidating Israel's relationship of peace with the UAE and again, several other Arab nations this past over the past 12 months. We did so because we felt that this peace process is a crucial way of helping not only sustain the state of Israel and its security, that would be the largest you know, Jewish community anywhere in the world. We also did so because we saw it as an important measure in the process of fighting all forms of hate. ADL's Global 100 survey, the landmark analysis that we do of anti-Semitic attitudes around the world. When we conducted it in 2014, it found that the Middle East was by far the region of the world where the largest proportion of people hold attitudes that we consider anti-Semitic, negative segments, set sentiments about the Jewish people, and a range of harmful Jewish myths and tropes. But the Abraham Accords included a historic commitment to jointly fight against hateful attitudes, against anti-Semitism and incitement, and to collaborate against the threat of extremism which endangers us all, and to encourage solidarity in the name of our faith's common ancestor, the biblical patriarch Abraham. 
The Abraham Accords are also serving as a springboard for encouraging people on both sides of the conflict to learn about one another, to empathize with their suffering, and to build a common front against intolerance and violence. So I am especially honored today to be welcoming a distinguished Emirati statesman and thought leader to serve as our featured speaker from the Arab world. His Excellency, Dr. Ali Rashid al Nuimi. Dr. Nuaimi serves in the UAE's parliament called the Federal National Council and as an appointee of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi and in a leadership role as the chairman of the Council's Defense Affairs, Interior and Foreign Affairs Committee. He's also the founding visionary behind several important international institutions headquartered in the UAE that contribute to the global fight against terror. He was a founding secretary of the Muslim Council of Elders. He founded and currently chairs the World Muslim Communities Council. And these are two organizations that really helps focus, that focus on helping mobilize Muslim faith leaders to champion peace, tolerance and coexistence around the world. He also continues to serve as the founding chairman of Hedaya, an intergovernmental center of excellence on combating violent extremism which recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Israel's Reifman University IDC in Herzliya. When Dr. When Dr. Nuaimi gave his keynote speech to IDC Herzliya's International Counterism Terrorism Summit earlier this month, he provided a heartfelt and inspiring encapsulation of what makes this peace accord so special. Even though the UAE is routine subjected to harsh criticisms and even demonization by the forces of intolerance in the region for engaging with the Jewish state. The Emiratis continue to stand shoulder to shoulder in solidarity with Israelis in their struggle for a more peaceful and tolerant future for the region. As he told his audience, the Israeli audience last week, that quote, your war against terrorism is not your war, it's the world's war, and you are doing it on behalf of the world, end quote. He emphasized to them that people of good conscience must stand in solidarity with Israel against terrorism and that the people of the Jewish state are not alone in their fight for survival. And you could see that it touched the hearts of the people in that room, helping Israelis to truly see that they are not alone and to envision a day when even more of the region accepts them for who they are and that they belong. Now today, we're also going to hear about these important trends over the last year on the Israeli side from the head of our Israel office, Carol Nuriel. I can tell you that Carol works every day on issues of Arab-Israeli coexistence and understanding within Israel, culminating in her team's flagship event, Israel's Social Cohesion Summit, which is the largest event of its kind in the, that happens you know, on the public calendar in Israel, where leaders of all the various communities, Jewish communities, Arab communities, Jerusalem communities, people who are refugees and Jews of different backgrounds, Ethiopians, Sephardi, Mizrahi, et cetera, Ashkenazi, they all come together to talk about how to build a more democratic, equal and inclusive society in Israel. Carol also is a fluent in Arabic, an expert in classical Arabic, and as such brings a perspective that takes into account the cultural and religious differences and commonalities of the people in the region. <coughs> like, excuse me, like five of Israel's cab like five of the cabinet ministers in the new Israeli government, Carol is an Israeli of Moroccan heritage, having grown up in Israel as the child of Moroccan immigrants. Like so many other Israeli Jews, for her, the Israeli-Moroccan peace agreement that the Abraham Accords made a reality this past year was deeply meaningful, not just as a political alliance, but on a personal level. And from a professional vantage point, I'm proud to say that she uniquely can attest to how these peace accords are having a ripple effect across Israeli society, resonating in people's daily lives and on their sense of Israel's growing acceptance in the region. And I know firsthand, having worked with her for the past six years, she is one of the most talented professionals in our entire global organization. So Your Excellency, Doc, Your Excellency Dr. Naimi, Carol, thanks to both of you for making the time to be with us today for this important conversation. So if I might, Dr. Naim, I'd like to call on you first and ask um, if you, actually, why don't we ask both of you, but starting with you, Your Excellency, 
if you could take two to three minutes just to talk about an overview of the past year, what the Abraham Accords have meant for your society in the UAE and then Carol, you in Israel, and talk about where you think we go from here. Starting with you, Your Excellency. Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan. First, you know, I'd like to thank you for uh, organizing such event and for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, uh, with your audience. And, uh, you know, before, before I proceed in answering your question, you know, I, I, I just want to, you know, praise what you are doing at the ADL, your team. And, you know, whenever we talk about uh, the Abraham Accord, you see, I always, you know, you know, think about your contribution because the work that you have done uh, for many years and the engagement that we did uh, with you actually together paved the way actually and build a bridge of trust uh, between us and with others also that you know enable us to make the, the right decision when it came to you know moving, moving forward with the Abraham Accord. Uh, when we you know when we reflect on you know a year since you know the signing of the Abraham Accord, uh, you know uh, I want to say this. The region has changed. It's not only the UAE and Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, the way that the people, not only the government, look at Israel and look at the added value of peace, we start seeing it, you know. And you will notice this in, 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 in following the, the public opinion uh, in the Arab world, actually. Uh, the engagement between the UAE and Israel when you know you know as we expected uh, in all sectors uh, you know now we have students studying in israel we have many agreement uh, in health in technology in agriculture in water and others and these are not only agreement but uh, you know it's it's uh, they started implementing this agreement and you will you you know every month you will see that there is something a new initiatives uh, either from the government or the private sector between the UAE uh, and Israel. And all this happened while we are suffering from COVID-19 restriction. If we didn't have that, you know, I assure you, things will be much better. Uh, what I want to say and emphasize is always look at the big picture. Uh, the, the added value of the Abraham Accord we see it everywhere. Even the, the peace treaty that had been done between Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. Now you see it, it's, it's coming to life. The relationship between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan has changed. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen in the last uh, 30 or uh, 20 years, but it happened this year, actually. So uh, I am, I'm really happy. I am very optimistic. Uh, I know those who uh, uh, promote terrorism, promote hate, are speaking loudly and they have their own platform. But, you know, always consider the, the silent majority and, you know, focus on them and invest in them uh, and, and try to target them. Ignore those who, you know, uh, speaking loudly against uh, Israel or against uh, those who, who the UAE or uh, Bahrain or Morocco or Sudan. Ignore them. Just focus on, on the positive things, on what we are doing. Uh, at the end, peace will prevail. At the end, what people want, actually, they want security, stability, prosperity for all. And Peace will, be, will bring that to them, not war and not hate. Here, here. I couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. Carol, do you want to share some general impressions and thoughts? Sure, and thank you, Jonathan and Chag Sameach, for those who celebrate uh, Sukkot. And what a pleasure it is to be here with you, Jonathan, and with, with Dr. Enwaimi. Um, I just have to start with a personal note. When I go back to the signing of the agreements a year ago, I cannot but feel again the excitement and the feeling that it was, at least for me personally, a dream come true, no less than that. 
And nationally, this first agreement with the UAE has become just the event that started such a positive snowball that affected Israel's bilateral relationship with Arab state in he, states in a historic way. So not only with the UAE, it started with the UAE, but we just saw more and more agreements, much more than Israel expected when it signed um, the agreement with the UAE. With your permission, I would like to start to address uh, your question, Jonathan, on two levels. First of all, the people to people um, level and then the political slash regional uh, one. For Israelis, we have to understand that this normalization agreement came as a third attempt to make peace with the Arab world. A little more than 40 years after the agreement with Egypt, a little more than 25 years after the agreement with Jordan, Israelis were eager to see what the nature of the normalization agreement with the UAE would be. But to understand, I would say that the place where Israelis came from, we should look for a second about how Israelis feel about the agreements with Jordan and Egypt, Egypt because I think we're going to see um, different approaches. Generally speaking, while there's an understanding among Israelis that strategically those two peace treaties were instrumental not only for uh, regional stability, but also for Israel's security specifically, the average Israeli doesn't feel that, you know, these peace treaties, you know, touch him or her. There's very limited tourism between the countries, a lot of political sensitivities, only selected business people and entrepreneurs um, work with their counterparts. Joint projects are stuck and more than anything else, the conversation about the other is somewhere between indifferent, I would even say, to hostile. And on top of that, the fact that our leaders didn't meet for years and the security cooperation is probably the only deep-rooted dimension, I think that this is exactly what was different with the normalization agreement with the UAE. So the fact that the agreement was signed not after years of hostility, but just an official sort of non-recognition all of it shifted the conversation in Israel, and I believe it shifted the conversation about Israel in the Arab world. And if we try to track where it touched the Israeli public, I think that the special address by UAE ambassador uh, to the US, Yusuf al Taiba, was really the first se step, this direct message to Israelis in the second highest um, circulated newspaper in Israel, Yediot Achronot, was very impactful, even though I believe that not all Israelis would agree with the terms uh, that were presented in this piece. And what reinforced the trust um, among Israelis is that the agreement with the UAE was the first in the series of, of agreements, um, as I said. So then not only that Israelis started to fly to Dubai in masses, <clears throat> but that Israeli planes were also allowed to fly over the Saudi airspace, and the cultural and civilian aspects of normalization that are only expanding really made, I think, Shimon Peres' vision about the new Middle East a reality Israelis could trust. Um, a couple of words about the political and regional level, even though it has only been one year since the signing of the accords, the leaders in the US and in Israel who were responsible for them, President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu, are no longer in power. So moving forward, the nature the impact of the accords greatly depend on the vision of the newly elected leaders in both countries, uh, President Biden, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett. Prime Minister Bennett has demonstrated um, an interest in broader regional cooperation. And we saw the meeting that he had with President Assisi of Egypt and, and uh, the encounters with uh, the Jordanian king. So the Abram Accords will also play a role in this regional effort. And lastly, I'll go back just for one second to the public element. I read somewhere that when you Google Israel peace versus Israel war, the Israel war gets three times more results. It's a very clear indication about which sort of reality, content, and discourse we are exposed to and used to, and people are used to use for us as Israelis, so any peace treaty. And we'll talk about that later is a step in the right direction, I believe. Here, here, I could not agree more. And it's so exciting to hear that response from Israeli society, which confirms much of what we know. And my goodness, I hope one day that Israel and the UAE and all these countries will be defined much more by peace 
than by war, much more by coexistence than conflict. I think that's honestly what we all want. And again, that's how we create a better outcome for our children. So, you know, I'm interested, um, Your Excellency, Dr. Naimi, can you talk a little bit about what kind of ripple effects that the Israeli Emirati peace has created inside the UAE? And what do you anticipate going forward, either domestically, like internally, or maybe bilaterally, or maybe even multilaterally as a result? Do you think that, what else do you think this augurs for UAE and for the region? Well, you see, uh, when I talk about the UAE, I, I, I see that, first of all, you know, the, the Jewish community within the UAE uh, has grown in the last year. And, and we, we, we saw that many uh, moved from many parts of the world coming to the UAE. And they, what I am really proud of that they came to the UAE, although it's, you know, just months of signing the Abraham Accord, they felt that, you know, they are at home. They felt that they are safe. They felt that they are welcome. And you know, this is deep feelings. I, I, many, I have many friends of them. This is, you can't make them with a decision. You can't uh, give them to a person by giving him a speech uh, or uh, uh, some guarantee. It's something that he feel it dealing with people, interacting with people. So this is, you know, this is a real achievement that we see the, the outcome of our investment on, on coexistence in our educational system, in the reform of our religious uh, narrative, you see, in, in the reform in our laws, you see, in, in, and, and the, the structure of the lifestyle that we were able uh, to create within the UAE. So, you know, having a person who before maybe six or eight months was look was was considered that an enemy and now he is with you living as a neighbor you see him in a restaurant in a coffee shop in the mall and he feels that he's very safe you know because he is in your country he is in your neighborhood he is sitting with you in a restaurant or in a coffee shop that this is the real achievement and great achievement that we have to consider uh, and this comes through the interaction with the people, not only, not only with, the, with the government. Also, you know, one of the things that I see within the UAE, it showed that, you know, we have to take a lead. We have, we have to be, have the courage to take the hard decision, actually, uh, to invest in peace and move forward, you know, with creating a partnership with those who believe in peace in the region, and, and uh, in the world. And this is why, you know, we, we feel in the UAE, it's not only the government, but we see the added value of this within the general public, that peace, you know, will, will bring great things to our uh, country and also to the region. And because of the courage of our leadership that, you know, they made with making that decision to make peace with Israel and sign the Abraham Accord, they saw that, you know, we have to move forward with, sh with, with such initiatives. And you have to, uh, you know, also consider that we are talking about this, why we are maintaining the COVID-19 restriction and the impact on, on the economy, on the health system, on all sectors. But, you know, we still, you know, enjoy the, 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 the outcome of the peace treaty. And this is why the UAE, you know, when, when coming uh, to countering COVID-19, uh, develop a strategy. First, we work with the Israeli, we coordinate things with them, but at the same time, we played, we played a major role in helping the region and the world, actually, to, to uh, counter this, this threat, COVID-19, by helping more than 120 uh, countries. So, you know, when I say the UAE, we believe now, as a nation, we believe in peace and we believe in giving and supporting the others to, to create a better life for all, all humankind. So mm. it's a responsibility that we share, not only as a government, but as a people that we have to care about others 
regardless of their religion, their ethnic, their nationality. Mm. Well, you know, that's interesting. Let me, if I might just ask a follow-up question, then I'll come back to you, Carol. You know, to your point, it is interesting because I think in some ways the UAE and Israel have a lot in common. They're both diverse societies. They're both powerhouses of innovation. Your point about COVID-19 and working to better countries beyond themselves. And they're also, by the way, close you know, security partners of the US against fighting against violent extremism in the Middle East. And yet in other ways, I think the two countries have some real differences, even some, you know, for example, the UAE has a much more developed energy infrastructure. And, and recently, I think, made a large investment in uh, one of Israel's largest natural gas fields. Yes. And I think Israel, uh, you know, even during the pandemic, an astonishing number of Israelis came to Dubai as tourists. So I wonder if there are other ways you think the two societies complement one another, right? That they can learn from each other. And I guess I would also just ask on the tourism front, do you think Emiratis will come to Israel too? Do you think there's a mutual interest in learning about one another? Well, you see, I can assure you that once COVID-19 restrictions are left, you will see thousands of Emiratis, uh, mm -hmm. you know, going to Israel uh, as, as tourists. Uh, they will go, you know, for, for health services, you know, for so many things. Uh, and more, more from the, our side, a more uh, student will go out to study uh, in, 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 in Israel. You know, but there, there is something happening next week. I think that will, 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 will move the relation, not only the, the UAE-Israeli relation, but the reputation of Israel in the region and the world. And that's uh, Expo 2020. Uh, mm. We have the Israeli pavilion, and it, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 will, it will show the world, not an Israeli, uh, it will show the world, Israel, not only uh, as a state, uh, people know Israel as uh, security and security and army, but they will show them something different, which is related to, to culture, related to innovation, related to how we as human being, you know, can benefit from each other. And you know, that, that can, we can, we have to live together. We have to work together to create a better future of all of us. You see, we are expecting about 25 million visitors during the, six, the, the next six months to Expo 2020. It's a great platform for Israeli to send the right messages to the region and to the world. And because I expect millions of Arab youth will be coming to Expo 2020. They will have an opportunity to see the other side of Israel that they never seen before. Here, here. Well, so let me ask the question to you, Carol, like how do you see it changing Israeli society? And what do you see as maybe some of even the complementaries between Israel and the UAE? There's clearly so much in common, but how do you think they can also help learn from one another? Carol, you're on mute. Oh, I'm so sorry. No problem. It's an interesting question, Jonathan. Obviously, there are a lot of, of commonalities and a lot of differences between uh, the UAE and, is and Israel. But I think that one thing that I can definitely say is that, A, the fact that we don't share a border doesn't mean a lot today because in the era of no borders, we can definitely have a common and joint project. And I think that if we're seeking actually to bring a contribution to the world together, then the most important thing would be to fight together extremism and radicalization, which we see in our region, opposing a real, real threat to societies and uh, countries. Um, I do want to talk about how Israelis look at this peace treaty, because I think it's very, very important. Um, we at ADL, know very well that you know stereotypes are given life and flourish when there's alienation when people have no encounter and only by creating those encounters we start this process of uprooting stereotypes and we saw that through israelis who come back from dubai and they are amazed but what you just mentioned the innovation the advanced mm. hospitality the touristic experience and so on but here's the thing while the uae is really an amazing success story 
I believe that if other Arab countries open for Israelis, Israelis will have a, have a similar feeling, a similar experience, and a similar sense of understanding that, hey, we have a lot in common. We can mm. work together, starting with the fact that we live in a similar geographic area, and that means a lot in today's world, which is talking a lot about environment. Mm. And we can definitely work together to fight all of these threats that the environment which we have no control over really creates for us. Of course. And, and going to innovation and technology, which we all use. I mean, we don't, we don't, you know, split in today's world between those who use technology and those who don't. We all use technology. So definitely a lot in common and a lot in common and a lot um, not not only to complement one another, but really, really work together. Here, here. Well, look, I'd like to ask one more question before you open it up, because there are a lot of interesting questions being raised in the chat. And I guess I'll put this to the both of you. Um, yeah, so how, are, how would we say that Emiratis and Israelis are thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the goal of achieving a state solution, you know, one year after the Abraham Accords? Are there ways in which the normalization of relations between Israel, the UAE, and by the way, the other Arab states, can benefit the Palestinians, maybe increase their receptivity toward a peace process and help move the conflict closer to an eventual resolution. You know, again, I would invite both of you, uh, Your Excellency, coming from UAE, but Carol, you also get coming from Iraq, a Moroccan family for whom these issues are really deeply personal. And as someone who's worked on coexistence in Israel, between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews, between Israelis and Palestinians, I would love to hear both of your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, first, uh, Jonathan, you know, when we talk about peace, we talk about peace for all. Hmm. And, you know, no one will, you know, will accept having peace in the region without, you know, that the Palestinian will enjoy also security, stability, and prosperity. Uh, the problem is, is, is with the leadership who are speaking on behalf of the Palestinian and looking into the way to proceed with the peace. And, and I, I believe, you know, the, the Palestinian people, you know, started to see things in a different way after a year from signing the Abraham Accord. Uh, in the UAE, we have about 400,000 Palestinians. Uh, and, and in other areas, uh, in other countries, we engage with them in a discussion. Oh, the majority of them, they believe in peace. And they believe in in, 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 in in having a peace with Israel. Uh, and they believe in the two-state solution. We all, you know, believe in this. And, and the international community support this. The, our problem, the challenge that we are facing, we don't have the right partner in the Palestinian leadership. There mm -hmm. is Abbas, there is Hamas. You know, they, they, they do care about their position uh, they have their own personal agenda. It's not the agenda of the Palestinian people. So we will still be struggling uh, until we, we, we have a leadership that believe in peace and willing to take the hard decision and move forward in implementing the two-state solution. Here, here, Carol. Um. You know, Jonathan, what's, not, uh, what's also noteworthy about the accords is that they weren't contingent on progress on the Israeli-Palestinian track. Now, we can definitely tell you that as an Israeli, I felt that, you know, that was a moment of, you know, while there was a lot of happiness about the agreement, but I felt that there was a missing point here. The UAE and Bahrain support the Palestinian aspiration to establish a state, and we respect that. In fact, ADL is a strong supporter of, a supporter of this two-state solution, meaning a secure and independent Jewish state alongside a secure and independent Palestinian state. We've long maintained um, that this was the only viable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But at the same time, we believe broader normalization between Israel and its neighbors should not be contingent on Israeli-Palestinian peace and that such normalization is not just an Israeli interest, but it also serves uh, the interests of these countries as well. As Israelis, you know, we have Gaza and we have the PA, and those are different entities. It should be very clear that when we talk about Gaza, when we talk about Hamas as an organization, 
we understand what they're all about. They are a ter terrorist organization that is attacking civilians, innocent Israelis, but no less than that. They are acting against their own people, the people of Gaza. So I think in this respect, the UAE were right in determining the right approach during, for, for example, the May conflict. They will be there for Gazans with any humanitarian aid needed if this will be well coordinated by Egypt but not if Hamas handles it. And I think that this reflects an understanding of the danger of Hamas on one hand and the suffering of the Gazans on the other, and also um, of the importance of dealing with the Palestinian issue. With regard specifically to the PA, um, I think that it's also fair to say that the Israeli society understood something in recent months, which is the centrality, the importance, of the Palestinian identity for Israeli Arabs and for the region. Just understand, face it, understand that it exists and that we as Israelis cannot ignore it. So I would say that for us as Israelis, this just adds to what we knew when the agreements were signed. As much as we are eager to have relationship with the Arab world, the Palestinian cause is not going anywhere. And, and both the Palestinians and his Israelis are here to say, and we cannot, and we better not ignore that, and we better work on it in the framework of the agreement better, and if not separately. But this is here to stay, and we should definitely deal with it. Great. Well, thank you for that. So there are a bunch of good questions, again, that relate to these issues, I would say. I would just underscore that I do think much like you know, Dr. Naimi said before, we will never have peace unless we get this issue resolved. But we need a partner. We need a partner on both sides who wants to resolve it. So there are some real challenges we have in the current, you know, in the current situation. That being said, uh, Deb, if you're still with us, I'd love to pass it to you to kind of get into some of the questions that have been raised in the chat. Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, and thank you to both of our panelists. This has been a fantastic conversation. So we've gotten a lot of questions and they're around the same themes. So uh, so we're gonna start here uh, and uh, I'm gonna try and condense them so we can cover as much ground as possible. So in talking about anti-Semitism, are there any other ways in which you would like to see Israel, the UAE and the broader international community for that matter, cooperate to make an impact in the fight against anti-Semitism? Are there any ways in which you would like to see them cooperate in the fight against Islamophobia and anti-Arab bigotry? How would that work? Well, I, uh, you see, I believe that our focus should be on countering hate, regardless of the root of that hate, the source of it, or the audience that the hate targeted. So, uh, you know, at the end, you know, people who have hate they suffer themselves and, and they spread hate within their family before they, they hurt others by the hate that they counter. So uh, I believe it's very important when dealing with this issue, such as hate, that we have to understand the role of education, the role of religious uh, leaders, the role of public figures, and community leaders. Uh, education, you know, the initial uh, tools to promote coexistence and counter hate. And we should start from KG, not from university, uh, to promote these, you know, the values that we have uh, toward others uh, as, as a human value. So you know, we need to invest in education, also, religious leaders, uh, you know, always when you talk about religious leaders, we talk about dialogue. Uh, that's good, but that's not enough. I think it's very important that we move to the next uh, level by talking about the engagement of religious leaders. When you engage with them, you know, you, you start, you know, gaining their trust first, show, showing them that they have a role to play and you see, engaging with them in a way by, by, by showing them the added value of their role. Uh, if we don't engage the religious leaders, they will engage with something that will, you know, make us all suffer. And that will create a vacuum also 
that we will be filled by others. So it's very important when it comes to countering hate that we engage religious leaders from uh, all sectors. Uh, also the public figures, the NGO, the community leaders, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter that we need to engage all the stakeholders in it. And when it comes to politicians, it's very important that they shouldn't play, play politics when it comes to countering hate. You know, uh, they can do whatever they, they want when it comes to political differences. But when it's come to hate, we have to unify the world to counter hate. If I may, if I may comment on that, Jonathan. Um, first of all, Dr. Anwami, let me just say that I'm a little bit jealous of you in the UAE because you have a ministry, a ministry dealing with tolerance. And I can tell you that from an Israeli per perspective, the UAE has done so much in this year with res uh, respect to Holocaust education. It has become the first Arab country to open a Holocaust education exhibit. So the CCM, the Crossroads of, of Civilizations Museum in Dubai opened the We Remember exhibition and it featured testimonies of Holocaust survivors and the exposure that Emiratis get, got to the Holocaust is really, really tremendous. Something that they have never, you know, that, that a lot of Arab countries have refused to teach about the Holocaust, linking it to sort of an acknowledgement of the Jewish right to self-determination in the land of Israel and so on, which is a mistake because to be clear, we don't believe the Jewish right to self-determination is rooted in the Holocaust. Um, and we seek to sort of break this connection. But I do wanna say also to add to what you say about, you said about um, countering hate. You know, we at ADL work obviously um, most of our time in countering anti-Semitism and all sorts of hate. And we know very well that anti-Semitism does not live in a vacuum. It interacts with other sorts of hatred that exist in the same space. And when you see anti-Semitism in one society, you will probably meet also Islamophobia and other sorts of hatred. And this is why, uh, let me just you know, take this COVID phrase, we're all in it together, should be uh, our slogan of fighting hate. We're all in this together because your, pro your problem is not your problem, it's our problem, as you said about terrorism. So hatred against Arabs should be, the fight against hatred against Arabs should be my interest, as your interest should be to fight. Here, here. I don't have anything to add to that, Deb. I think both of them said it so well. But I do think that we have a shared struggle against hate. Hatred against, as a Jewish person, a hatred against an Arab person or a Muslim person, that's my problem too. Just like anti-Semitism isn't just the issue of the Jews, it should be the issue of Muslim people, Christian people, people of all faiths. We're all ultimately in this together if we really want to create a better world. I think that was a, a point worth adding, Jonathan. Thank you. So you both touched on this a little bit in your answers just now, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the role of education and, and what you see as having changed or the potential to change thanks to the progression with the Abraham Accords. Uh, you know, for example, uh, somebody in the chat specifically noted um, or asked about maps in Palestinian textbooks, for example, that are excluding Israel. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the role of education in terms of content or classroom discussion, or maybe even opportunities for international education and dialogue, especially among our youth. Uh, well, you see, uh, you see, I am an academician by training. I believe in education. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always see the added value uh, of using education uh, in changing the whole society and in creating a better future for any, any, any society. Uh, in the UAE, what we did actually when it's come, we did, you know, uh, a reform in our curriculum. We did special training for teachers. We also did a reform in our uh, legislation and laws also to make sure that no one will break the law by, you know, by spreading hate against any religion or against any ethnics. So uh, it's very important that, you know, you see the, you, you, you see the added value of education. 
And you do that by first making sure that the curriculum that you develop promote coexistence, pr uh, promote the, the, the great values that we share together in our religion and our tradition and, and, and try you know, to make sure that the new generation, you know, they absorb these values as human values, but not as you know, their own values only. It's a human values, they have to share it. At the same time, you, may, you have to make sure that you, you do profession, professional development program for the teachers, because even if you have the outstanding curriculum, you don't know what ha will happen in the classroom. So if the teachers don't believe in, 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 in these values, they will not you know, uh, engage with the student uh, uh, within these values. So we did invest in this for many years and where we di didn't compromise, we didn't have any compromise when we, we counter a teacher trying to promote hate. We make you know, the hard decision to remove them immediately because that's for us in the, in the UAE, we don't tolerate such a, things. Because if we do in one incidence, that will send the wrong signal to, to others. Uh, but you see, what I want to say, hate is the world responsibility. It's not a single nation. It's not a single region. You know, uh, you see me, I'm traveling now. I was, I was in Austria, then Italy, then Germany, and now in, I am in a fourth country. But the th one of the main issues that I engage with them is, is the threat of uh, extremism and hate to their national security. And that they have to take the hard decision in investment in education, especially, to promote coexistence and counter hate. Because you won't be able to have uh, a stable society. You won't, any society will not enjoy security, stability, if there is part of it are spreading hate. Uh, that will destroy everything. So it's very important to see the added value of, of, of the educational system and to invest in it. Uh, when you said that, you know, in, in, unfortunately in, in many schools, not only within the, uh, the Palestinian school, but in other parts in the Arab world and Muslim world, and you might see them also in some of the media platform, that when they show the, 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 the map of the Middle East, they don't show Israel, you know. This is will change, but you know we have to change it immediately in our textbooks, uh, in our school system. Uh, this is you know we we want our kids to see things as they are, as as what they will be in the future also. Um, Deb, to answer your question, which is. Um you know, really, really great. There's so much we at ADL can say about the power of education in changing uh, attitudes and uprooting stereotypes and biases. So really, really a lot to talk about. But I think that, that as, let me, it, you know, it led me just to reflect for a second about when I was a child in the Israeli education system and the agreements with, the agreement with uh, Egypt was signed, you know, you learn about the fact that the agreement was signed and the Countries have peace treaties, but you never meet an Egyptian. You never learn about uh, the Egyptian culture, about what it is to, meet, to be an Egyptian who lives in a neighboring country. And the same is about uh, Jordan. So one of the things that I really, really think that the education system needs to consider, and by the way, that's true also internally to the Israeli society about knowing the other, is that we should do a better job in educating our children on knowing the other, where, whether, um, he is or she is a peer Israeli or somebody from the region. Second, let me just mention that in past agreements Israel signed, one of the things that, um, that was established uh, is a committee to counter, to prevent incitement. Now, um, I should say that those committees were very, very unsuccessful, but I think that such a mechanism um, that will be officially established by countries like Israel and the UAE that today are in a totally different place could be very, very instrumental in really um, creating a path for children and for youth in schools just to know one another, you know, in a better way and really 
to pave the way for people to people relationship and peace, that would be a much better way than what we had before. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Uh, there's been a lot of questions that have focused on the conflict with Hamas that happened this past May. Would you say that there have been any changes? Was it different this time around because of the Abraham Accords? I mean, Carol, you, I know, were forced into bomb shelters with Hamas rocket fire. Was there any different sense on either side, both on the ground in the UAE or Carol in Israel, that felt different knowing that there was this agreement that was in place? Carol, you want to start? I will start if that's okay. Please. You know, I have to say that as I think that the general perception among Israelis is that they see the Arab world, you know, in this very monolithic view of the Arabs. I think that due to the peace and normalization treaties, we have learned in a way to, you know, make some differences. Now, that does not mean that we love the one and we don't love the other ones, but we do make the difference between those we have peace with and those that we have um, um, hostility with. So the fact, I think that for Israelis, as I said before, the UAE stood in the right place, offering humanitarian assistance to Gaza, which is so important and, and, and make no mistake, that's an interest of Israelis to help you know, Gaza in you know, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And at the same time say, if Hamas is handling it, we're not in the game. I think that was a very, very encouraging approach for all Israelis. And again, let me just say that, you know, the fact that the UAE signed an agreement with Israel, and that, that's, that from a perspective, I'm just trying to represent here also Israeli Arabs, the fact that they were not taken into account, the fact that they voted against in the Knesset, against the agreement, because they were never consulted, that, that's how they felt. So I think there's also room for us to mediate this agreement in a different way to Israeli Arabs, to talk to them about it, to talk, about, to talk to them about how it serves also their interest, to find a way through this agreement as a bridge also to renew the talks with the Palestinians. So again, Jonathan, you're absolutely right. We should have you know, the right leadership on both sides, absolutely. Mm. But people to people, there are things that I think we can do. Thank you, Carol. Dr. al Noemi. Yes, well, you see, uh, uh, I think, you know, looking at that war, after signing this agreement uh, by, say, uh, eight or 10 months, uh, made us, and other Arab in, re in the region, look at it from different angle, different than the one uh, at the 2008 war, where they saw that the, 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 there is Israeli victims. You know, you know, Arabs never thought about that, that there, there is Israeli civilian victims of this war. At the same time, you know, in the Arab media, it, we saw that an Arab Israeli was you know injured fighting you know with Israeli against Hamas. So these things you know before you know the media didn't cover them. This is you know reflect what we believe in that you know the region should you know should aside with those who believe in peace. And of course the UAE you know the the the, the official position was was to stop the war. Uh, uh, from both sides and to help the, the, the Palestinian, but not to help Hamas. And, and this is where we, we, we were able to engage with the Israeli about this, coordinate things with them and with the Egyptian. And we were able to convince the Egyptian that you know any aid should go to the to the Palestinian to the Palestinian people in Gaza, but not to Hamas authority. And there, there we had, you know, the, the support of the international community. You know, I think that enabled us to isolate Hamas. 
We couldn't do that before. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And I have to say like, that there are so many more questions that even I personally just want to ask. Uh, that's a, definitely a sign of a good program. Uh, so instead, I, I will take a moment to thank Jonathan and to thank His Excellency Dr. Ali al Nuemi, and of course the wonderful Carol Nuriel for joining us today, and thank all of you for being with us today as well. We're going to press pause for a minute on fighting hate from home, but keep an eye out because we'll have plenty of details for Never Is Now, which is coming up in November, and we look forward to seeing you then. Until then, please continue to stay healthy and safe. Be well. Thank you. Stay safe, all of you.